as the Council of New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome. My name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about prevention and survivorship, specifically diet and exercise. So first some housekeeping, if you experience any technical problems, you can either mention them in the chat box, which is on the left hand side or right hand side of the screen. Depends, I think, on your computer. Um, and or you can call the 1800 number, which is shown in the chat box. If you have any sound problems, you can listen using your telephone by dialing the 1800 number, again shown in your chat box, and then enter the passcode provided. So we want to hear from you tonight. Feel free to enter your comments in the chat box. We encourage you to participate, support each other. Tell us what you thought about the information presented, whether you can relate or not, whether the information was useful, would you do any of the things we're talking about. And also if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat box too. This webinar is being recorded and everyone who registered will be sent a link to the recording. So don't worry if you get distracted by the chat box because you can watch the webinar later. So if at any stage you need, feel you need to speak to somebody urgently, please do not hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24-7. So let's get started. Firstly, I would like to introduce our panel. We have at the end of the table Claire Hughes, Hi. <laughs> uh, Jane Turner and Rima Mohammed. Thank you. And um, we have Annie Miller in the chat box tonight, so please say hello to Annie. So I'm going to hand over to Rima now, who is going to tell you a little about her story. I'll give you the now. Um, hello, my name is Rima. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with um, breast cancer in uh, August 2013. Um, grade 3 triple negative breast cancer. I uh, had a lumpectomy end of August and then uh, commenced four cycles of chemotherapy in September. Um, I had, uh, after my second cycle of chemo, I had a bit of a reaction to the chemo, so they upped my steroids. Um, and while I was having chemo, they said, I asked the doctor, was there anything I should watch, um, um, not eat or, or eat? And the doctor just said, look, just eat whatever makes you feel good. Um, after my chemotherapy, I had radiation, um, and then after my radiation, I um, was reviewed by my uh, oncology doctor. And in the um, in my appointment with her, because um, they weigh you every time you go to your appointments, I've noticed I put on eight kilos. And um, I said to my doctor. Um, I need to lose some weight now because I put on too much weight and she basically referred me to um, the survivorship clinic at Concord Hospital where I attended there um, in March and that's where I met um, Jane, the exercise physiologist, <laughs> and Cindy, the dietitian, and then I met a breast care nurse and a psychologist um, and at that clinic I don't think I was very good cried my way through the whole hour of the clinic appointment. Um, and then after that, um, I got enrolled in the RICH program, which I commenced in May, which involved two hours of, um, two hours every, I think, fortnight or week, week, weekly of um, lectures of, about nutrition and exercise, um, and which was very good. It just um, helped, uh, me identify what was good to eat and what wasn't good to eat um, and also uh, encourage us to start walking, doing exercises because um, after you have chemo radiation you're very fatigued and um, I noticed that I was having you know problems just walking down the street. I would get really tired, come back home, have another nap, then get up, go for another walk. Um, but by um, starting to exercise, the more exercise I did, the better I got at it. Um, Okay. With the Enrich program, we got this um, healthy eating chart, um, and the way for me to focus on <laughs> okay. um, the way for me to focus um, 
um, how to eat healthy, I put this chart on my fridge and I stuck it on my fridge and um, basically wrote the word cancer underneath the chart and said, you know, that was for me to focus if I had stuck to this um, regime of eating five serves of veggies, two serves of fruit, um, decrease my alcohol intake, um, uh, you know, uh, I would hopefully be okay. Um, from doing the Enrich program, I learned we did a food diary and from sitting down and going through with Cindy, the dietitian, I learned that I was eating too much fruit. Like I was eating five portions of five servings of fruit a day. Not that that was good for me and I had to cut back to two servings, which was good. And then increase my um, servings of veg vegetables. Um, for me, because I'm from uh, Middle Eastern background, it's not we don't eat meat and veggies, so it was quite hard to quite adapt to that. So I have to think of you know clever ways how to uh, include veggies in my um, meals. So I would um, Google recipes, you know, with veggies that I like, like eggplant and all that, and then go to the supermarket and find the um, find the exact ingredients and then come home and cook it. So it was good, and also we shared recipes in the group. Um, also, the other thing that I found with my um, eating is my portion size is too big. And um, Cindy went through what a normal portion size is, you know, a cup full of cooked pasta rather than a cup full of full pasta. When you cook it, it becomes like two or three cups full. So we went through portion size and trying to get used to reducing your portion size because you were still hungry after reducing your portion size. So trying to think of things to eat to snack on. Um, and I. The way I sort of try to curb my uh, cravings is I'd um, snack on uh, raw nuts or I'd uh, eat the veggies, uh, like carrot, broccoli raw that um, I didn't include, that I hadn't done my five servings a day. Um, also, we also learned how to read food labels. So um, to buy food that was at least, you know, less than three grams of fat or um, less than five grams of sugar, I think, yeah. So learn how to read, read food labels. So when I went to the supermarket, at least I um, tried to buy stuff that was uh, healthy. Um, I found, like, I, I love going to, I love food. I love going <laughs> to the supermarket. We all love food. Yeah, 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 no, no. And that was one of my struggles. Like, I, I, I my, one of my favourite things is go grocery shopping and find whatever, you know, food that I can cook. So I found it hard, but it was good because everybody in the group had similar problems with um, food, and we sort of all sat together and conversed together ways of, you know, um, finding better habits. Um, and we also kept a food diary, which by keeping a food diary, you sort of saw how much food that you ate and that you didn't really need to eat. So that was one good thing. Um, and the next thing about the was the exercise um, from Enrich. Um, before Enrich, I wasn't doing too much exercise because obviously I was fatigued from the um, chemo and the radiation, but I started walking and we started walking in the group um, with Enrich. We got a pedometer and um, we all tried to focus on doing 10,000 steps a day and I always tried to beat 10,000, I tried to do 12,000, 16,000. Sometimes you can do too much, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I started walking at home, you know, first when I first started walking, I sort of thought I'll do one block, and then as I got more energy, do two blocks, and then eventually now I walk for one hour, which is good. Um, and also, with in which we learned how to do resistance training, so using a band or weights, um, uh, thinking of ways to you know reduce our sitting time, like you know if we were talking on the phone rather than sitting and talking on the phone, maybe walking up and down the corridor in my house. Um, also finding ways to motivate myself to um, do exercise, like I did some fun runs, like the breast cancer one, and um, I've got a friend down the street who likes walking, so we tend we sort of walk three days a week together, um, and um, from in which I joined an exercise, which is a weight based weight training exercise program with Jane, and through that I went to the gym two days a week and I tried to walk two or three times at home on my own or with my friend. Um, I found by walking it helped clear my mind, like um, especially about the fear of recurrence. Um, 
like um, once I walked, I felt more energized. Um, I could um, think more clearly. I had a better start to the day, and my I found it easier for me to walk in the morning. Um, it, just basically, um, by walking in the morning, I felt more awake, more energized, ready for the day, rather than walking in the afternoon. Um, and then. And then um, my goal, hopefully to um, stay healthy, um, was to, um, I, I like to lose more weight. Obviously I've got another target, I've lost eight kilos from Enrich and from me exercising and I've got another five more kilos I want to lose now. Um, the way I stay active is I've joined the gym and I go to the gym three days a week and try and do some weights at the gym and do a few classes. Um, also, uh, if the, I, I would go to the gym on my days off and during my work days, um, I try and walk before work, at least two to three days a week. Uh, in the summer, I like swimming, so I'll go swimming in the summer. Um, also, recently I went away um, to Europe and um, rather than doing all the touristy things. I looked at hikes that I could do because I like walking now. So I did a few hikes and that was one of my hikes, Pol Brok in um, Norway. It looks scary for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> I met two girls there and they were young and fit and we started to walk together and um, they, I said to them, look, I'm tired, you go up. It took them an hour and a half to do it but it took me three and a half hours but it was the best thing I've ever done and then five hours to get down. But it was something that I achieved. I never thought I would get up there, but I mm. achieved it. And Great. if you put your mind to something, you can do it. Um, you got one more slide. Oh, I oh, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this was um yeah after at my trip yeah I um just to get away from you know what was happening at home. I had a friend who um, passed away from breast cancer, so that sort of triggered for me. So I thought I need to have a holiday, so I did nine weeks and that was one of the places I went to up to the Arctic and it was the most amazing trip I've ever done. I met some great people, we did some hiking as well there and um, we saw some polar bears and I had the best time and I felt the most relaxed I've ever felt in my life and I've come back energised. Really. How long ago was that? Uh, two months ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I put on maybe two kilos on my trip. <laughs> but That's lost, okay. But I've lost it. <laughs> You're on holiday. Yeah, I'm on holiday. Yeah, okay. yeah I've lost it. Well, thank you, Rima. Okay. So we'll pass over to Jane now. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Rima. Thank you yeah. very much. All right. So, exercise. Um, I'm very fortunate in my job. I love my job and I love to exercise and love to help other people exercise and introduce them to exercise and find, help people find things that they love to do as Rima was just saying before. So starting off with a little bit of a brief background. So exercise has been identified as an integral um, component to survivorship care to assist in the management of cancer and has beneficial effects on a number of um, physical and psychosocial outcomes. So at the moment there's many leading organisations worldwide, worldwide advocating exercise for cancer survivors. The research to date has predominantly evaluated the impact of exercise among people with cancer of breast and prostate natures. However, evidence is still building other types and also stages of cancer, so including advanced stages, but I'm not going to venture into exercise for um, advanced disease tonight. So we already do know that physical activity can decrease the risk of certain cancers developing in the start, so why can we not just generalise the same principles of cancer incidence into cancer occurrence? And the reason being is because there's so many factors that come into play such as different types of treatment, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, which the majority of people diagnosed with cancer will have some form of, and in many cases multiple forms. Um, 
maybe long-term long -term hormonal therapies. We still don't understand if the mechanisms for cancer recurrence are the same as um, cancer um, happening in the first place. So there's still a lot of unknown, but um, what we do know at the moment um, for benefits of exercise after being diagnosed with cancer is that yes, it is considered safe and effective. Um, and the strongest evidence in that top row is for improving things like physical function, so ability to do things through your day-to-day -day life, aerobic fitness, muscular strength and quality, general overall quality of life, as well as reducing cancer-related fatigue, which is one of the most commonly reported symptoms um, for people going through treatment, and also alleviating psychological distress. Some emerging research or newer research coming through highlights that participation in exercise following cancer treatment reduces the risk of new cancers developing and also the development of comorbid conditions and by that I mean things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes and osteoporosis. Um, we also, it's also emerging that it can counteract unfavourable changes in body composition. So things such as loss in muscle mass or a gain in adipose tissue or fat tissue. Um, it can help to minimise sexual dysfunction, which is coming through in some of the prostate cancer research, and also decrease pain. And also do enhance sleep quality, which sometimes does get forgotten about and not always mentioned in um, talks with the medical um, team. So further on to this, We've been observing from epidemiological studies, so just looking across populations, that suggest that exercise of moderate to vigorous intensity, which I'll go through a bit um, what, what that means a bit later on, can actually protect against cancer returning or coming back. And this is more so in the moment, looking at breast cancer, colon cancer and prostate cancer. And there's also some new trials at the moment going on looking in lymphoma. And this moderate to vigorous intensity exercise can, or we think, reduces by 20 to 60 percent of actually dying from cancer when comparing to people who are less active. So even though all of the above in that table are very important outcomes and are reasons in and of themselves to participate in exercise. People and medical professionals are interested in how it will affect long-term health, survival and prevent recurrence from cancer, which is what they're also trying to achieve through things like chemotherapy. So how it, to, to further establish this relationship between survival um, cancer and exercise, we do need large randomised control trials. And we are fortunate enough at the moment to currently be conducting in Australia in collaboration with Canada the, one of the first large multinational randomised control trials looking at the effects of exercise on reducing colon cancer recurrence in high risk stage 2 and stage 3 colon cancer patients who have finished their chemotherapy. And what this is, it's patients do get randomised into one of two groups. So the first group is a three-year exercise program where they also get provided with general health materials or the second group is just being provided with general health materials. And the health materials as they are provided with, um, what it was based on is the standard practice materials that the Canadians adopt at the moment in their cancer centres. If people are randomised into the exercise program, what it involves is supervised exercise sessions, generally with a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist, and behaviour counselling sessions. And the aim of this is to increase weekly exercise by two and a half hours from your starting level of exercise using moderate and vigorous aerobic-based activity. So we're currently recruiting in 27 centres around Australia and have reached 400 out of um, 962 participants. So we're, we're, we are well on our way through. I did want to um, point out and just make a note that there is actually a difference between the terms exercise and physical activity and sometimes they do get interchanged and mixed around um, but we do um, see them as two different things. So physical activity 
um, applies to any movement which is produced by muscles that requires your body to use energy. So things like housework and shopping. Whereas when you're looking, talking about exercise, that's what we refer to as a structured form of physical activity for the purpose of conditioning the body to improve your health and fitness. So fast walking, swimming, weights, dancing, cycling, all of those types of things. And that's sort of the basis of where my talk's coming from today, looking at the evidence of exercise. What we, um, and has been for a long time, research has established that the relationship between physical activity and improvements in general health and well-being of survivors um, from cancer, but it's also now looking at the amount of exercise that is performed at a moderate to vigorous intensity that they deem to be important for cancer specific um, and all cause mortality. So we're talking about moderate and vigorous intensity, it's things that get your heart rate going. So moderate intensity, you can talk but you can't sing. Or vigorous intensity, really um, high heart rate. Um, so things like running, um, where it is quite hard to talk. Um, and what we refer to this as is what we call a dose response relationship. So it's similar to being prescribed a medication um, for any any type of condition. They have, they give you a certain uh, milligram dosage, which they know is going to help in some way, and that's what we're trying to find out for exercise. So what's the optimal type, um, frequency, um, and intensity of exercise that can impact on different cancer-related outcomes? So. The current exercise guidelines um, arose from the American College of Sports Medicine, which is one of the peak professional bodies in the exercise science world, um, which came out in 2010 and was an extension from the Exercise and Sports Science Australia position stand. Um, and these things have now been incorporated into more recent recommendations, which have been promoted by the American Cancer Society and also the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So all of these things up on the screen are things that you can find and you can download. And what they are all really saying is the recommendations are to promote and avoid inactivity and progress towards returning to normal daily activities after cancer, participating in a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic exercise per week. So that's your running, swimming, dancing, etc. Plus two to three resistance exercise sessions, also known as weight training or strength training per week, again at a moderate to vigorous intensity. So you're looking at a little bit challenging um, to get that heart rate up and get those muscles working. However, these guidelines, um, you might notice, are actually quite similar to the exercise guidelines for the general population. So we do need to take into consideration type of cancer, potentially the presence and severity of treatment related side effects, um, your ability to move, range of motion after surgery, and any other precautions. Um, for example, lymphedema. Um, and we need to take this into account when starting or developing an exercise program for somebody to ensure that it is it is safe. So while um, so I'll, I'll re-emphasize that while the message of these guidelines are very generalized, it is important to start any new activity progressively and at an appropriate intensity and volume. I wanted to expand into this. This is a, quite a common question at the moment. So in regards to muscles and resistance training, and resistance training generally does get forgotten or pushed aside. Um, I mean, walking is the easiest, or generally the easiest type of exercise to do. It's inexpensive and very easy to access. But I just wanted to highlight the role that muscles can play through physical activity and exercise. And there are some theories. Um, for reducing the risk of cancer coming back. And these include things like increasing your sensitivity to insulin and increase, increasing anti-inflammation through your bloodstream, as well as improving your immune function. And, that, <coughs> excuse me, and there is also early research 
being conducted in animals, exploring the impact that these muscle myokines, which are these things that, that come from the muscle when you are exercising, and the impact that they have on tumour growth in certain cancers. And um, do, do these myokines actually inhibit tumour growth alongside things like um, chemotherapy and hormonal therapy? So we do need more research to support these, these ideas. But these ideas, uh, these things that are in that yellow box, they're things that we already do know. And those things are really important um, for other uh, prevention reasons, so reducing the risk of other chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which sometimes can actually be more common after a cancer diagnosis and treatment than the actual cancer coming back itself. <clears throat> so there's no harm in exercising, even if it doesn't have any impact on the cancer itself. So on top of these guidelines, there's a new pathway um, that they are talking a lot, of, of, about a lot more now, it, which is achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. And this is because there's accumulating evidence linking, linking obesity after a cancer diagnosis with overall health, well-being, and survival. So this gentleman who is the head of the American Society of Clinical Oncology is one of the premier oncology organizations in, in the world last year stated that obesity is on its way to replacing tobacco as the number one preventable cause of cancer. And there's been a direct association between obesity and the incidence of um, endometrial, colorectal, renal, esophageal, pancreatic, and postmenopausal breast cancer. However, they've also seen that at the time of diagnosis, you are overweight or obese, it actually has poorer prognostic factors or poorer outcomes in people diagnosed with breast cancer and colon cancer and prostate cancers. It's a very wordy slide, so you can peruse that later at your own leisure if you if you do like. So there are some some reasonings behind this linkage, and these things include um, obesity does increase the levels of insulin circulating through your body, which um, can lead to the increased risk of colon endometrial and kidney cancers. Um, there are certain types of adipose tissue or fat tissues or fat cells that are actually a source of inflammation that can promote cancer development. Um, an exercise, like we said in a couple of slides ago, can actually act as an anti-inflammatory source. So exercise to counteract these cells, even if you're not losing weight, sometimes there is still some change happening at a, a cellular and metabolic level. Um, we also know that obesity is linked with high levels of estrogen circulating through the body and we know that estrogen can be a promoter of some, um, some types of breast cancer and endometrial cancers. And all these inflammation sources can or may drive the growth of certain tumour types. So this led to 12 months ago now, this American Society of Clinical Oncology releasing this, this statement or end stand directed at medical, the, the medical profession more so, going into and evaluating the link between obesity and cancer. And they've, so they've, what they have, they've now established an initiative to reduce the impact that obesity has on cancer, including um, things from the ground level, which we've got, they've um, developed an information booklet, booklet, which is on your screen, for patients, um, but they've also developed a similar book directed for medical oncology professionals. So they also have access to how do we go about dealing with who do we refer to, when do we refer, and things like that. Um, those booklets can also be freely downloaded, and I'll pass those links on to Jill as well. However, with all this knowledge of um, the impact of exercise on different outcomes um, and obesity, there was a, one of the leading groups researching exercise in cancer. Um, his name is uh, Professor Cornea, he's in Canada, um, reported that a lot of people diagnosed with cancer don't seem to return to their pre-diagnosis levels of exercise once the treatment has finished. And if I just 
Yep, there we go. And what we also saw in recent data from Australia was that around, oops, sorry, around 70% of cancer survivors are not engaging in sufficient levels of exercise or actually not doing any at all. So we need to work out, okay, well, why is this the case? What is actually limiting people to returning to normal activities and, and returning to exercise? Because it's easy to say, well, everyone knows they need to exercise, everyone knows they need to eat well. But there's sometimes these um, barriers or limitations that can stop you. And the things on your screen, so we're looking at things like neuropathy from chemotherapy, so that's the pins and needles or the tingling, um, problems with bowel or bladder, um, urgencies, fatigue, which we know is, is a big one, um, a lack, a loss in strength, risks of infection, um, for, especially for people who have had stem cell transplants, lymphedema, uh, declines in bone health and changes in cardiac and heart health as well. And I've added two slides in here for you to have a look at later on. I'm not going to go through them in detail. And this is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network released earlier this year on things to consider if any of these um, things are um, ongoing issues for you at the moment. But sometimes a barrier might be as simple as who do you speak to in your medical team. Um, but sometimes it's also maybe the medical team doesn't even know who to go to or who to ask or who to refer to or what's available in their area. So one thing I wanted to point out is if you are searching for exercise advice is we have um, our allied health profession um, accredited exercise physiologist. So what we are, we are um, we hold a four-year university degree. We are classed as allied health professionals and we specialise in the delivery of exercise and lifestyle interventions for the prevention and management of chronic diseases and injuries. So um, this includes things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, mental health issues, arthritis and osteoporosis, to name a few. Um, exercise physiologists are also eligible to register with Medicare Australia and the Department of Veteran Affairs and we're also recognised by most private health insurers. And what I've put on the screen is just sort of um, highlighting the difference between an exercise physiologist and say a personal trainer. And personal trainers, that, um, they can be wonderful, um, but they, they are not trained in um, what happens after treatment from cancer. And, ongoing side effects and how to manage that through exercise. So they are trained in exercising people and gaining fitness and conditioning for people who we call apparently healthy. Um, so, But if you are thinking of accessing an exercise physiologist or have other questions, you may or may not have come across this before. Um, what it is, it's a chronic disease management plan which is arranged by your general practitioner and it entitles you to five services per calendar year for allied health and other services. Um, and it's worth a conversation with your local doctor to find out more information. So um, down the bottom of the screen, I've just taken snapshots of the form from the government website. Um, and chronic condition is classed as something um, that is anticipated or has lasted for six, around six months and cancer is is listed as one of those. Um, and what it is, you then get the Medicare rebate for a visit to one of these professionals. So what we are aiming, there's a, a group at the moment starting to be put together and the, the aim is to partner exercise with oncology centres around the country to help positively orient people with or recovering from cancer to improve things like strength, balance, endurance and general wellbeing. But to take from all of this, the message for people recovering from cancer is to remain physically active. We know more is better than less and something is better than nothing. Back to that dose-response relationship. Um, but starting with a targeted progressive program, um, looking at appropriate intensities and volumes and types, but also things that you enjoy. Um, to optimise health benefits is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, hand, hand the mouse now over to Claire. So Thank you. Claire, I'll figure my way around this 
uh, the technology. That's it. Um, so I'm Claire and I manage the nutrition unit at Cancer Council and we're part of the prevention team. Um, so I'm going to speak to you about some of what we know when it comes to healthy eating um, uh, to reduce your cancer risk. Um, but also the, the advice is very similar for people who are cancer survivors. Um, part of that is that all those behaviours are really important for cancer survivors but also uh, the evidence around diet within the within cancer survivor communities is actually quite new and it's not as it's not as strong as some of the evidence that we really have a quite a strong evidence base when it comes to um, to cancer prevention and healthy eating so um, the advice is true for you know all people that they should be um, you know thinking about the various sorts of healthy eating advice that we're going to be talking about. But one thing I did want to, to say up front is um, just like, you know, I think Jane said that speaking to, to a, um, an exercise physiologist is important for your, anyone who has particular, um, particular needs. It's also important that you speak to a, an accredited practicing dietitian if you're after personal healthy eating advice that's tailored for any particular condition that you might have, particularly if your cancer treatment has impacted on this. Okay. Oops. Next slide. <laughs> also, I think it's important to note that um, many of you will have been thinking about healthy eating during your cancer treatment. Um, we know that it's a time when you really go searching for advice, particularly about healthy eating, because it's something that you can do um, to, you know, you're looking for the things that are going to help you in your cancer treatment and it's something that you, you can have control over at a time when it is, you know, very confusing, you're getting lots of information and, you know, you're having lots of medical procedures and things like that. Also during cancer treatment you're probably thinking about how food um, might be tasting different, you've got a, you know, your appetite's not as good, um, the way your body is digesting food um, may change as well as a result of your, your cancer treatment and also you could be at risk of at increased risk of, of foodborne illness as well. So that's something that you probably have been considering when it comes to what you're eating. For some people during cancer treatment, uh, getting enough energy or kilojoules might have been a priority and, and uh, choosing a healthy diet may not necessarily have been your biggest priority when you're going through cancer treatment because you know obviously weight, weight loss for those who, who can't really afford to lose weight is something that, that we would want to minimise as well. But survivorship is a really good time to start thinking if you haven't already been about how you can be making some sustainable um, changes to the way that that you're eating um, and, and to your diet and to your weight. Um, I think I've seen from some of the comments about you know feeling normal again, um, and I think you know making healthy choices and improving what you what you eat can be a, a way of getting back to feeling normal as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to draw your attention to two things that are going to inform some of the things that I'm speaking about tonight. The thing, the, the, what you see on your left is the advice that from the World Cancer Research Fund around uh, healthy eating um, in uh, cancer prevention and also cancer survival. On the right I just wanted to flag that we do have some recent research um, out of Cancer Council at Cancer Council Australia around some of uh, what we know around preventing cancer and the rates of the numbers of cancers that could have been prevented through healthy lifestyle. Obviously we know that there are many things that contribute to, to a person's cancer risk and while we know that um, around a third could be attributed to some lifestyle factors. On the flip side of that, we know that not everyone's cancer is associated with these factors. So I don't want anyone thinking that we're suggesting that if you've got a particular cancer, then uh, not adopting these healthy behaviours or that, that they're a result of the fact that you haven't done this because it's very complex and everyone's situation is different. But this also informs some of the statistics that you might see on the screen as well. Um, and I can include the link to that um, when we send round yeah. links to the New Cancer Council Australia preventability estimate. I also thought it's important to just flag what we consider when we're looking at uh, the evidence around nutrition and cancer um, because 
every day we probably hear something new about what you know the, the latest research around diet and cancer or a particular food and a particular cancer risk or, or that kind of thing. Um, and but but the advice that uh, we're we're presenting today is about the totality of the evidence that we we know about different different um, foods and nutrients when it comes to cancer prevention. So the strengths of the association. So how strong are the findings in the studies, and how many studies have actually uh, been done in a particular area? Um, also the consistency of the research. So uh, is all the research saying the same thing? You know, is all the research suggesting that there is an, an association between obesity and, and a particular cancer, or are the results mixed? And that might be somewhere, some uh, an area where we're not as confident in giving you advice. Also, are there mechanisms? Can can we explain why a particular food might actually uh, be linked with with um, cancer risk or, or cancer prevention? Um, is another thing, and the quality of studies we look at as well when it comes to assessing the evidence. And as I said, there are actually fewer studies on the impact of, of diet on cancer survival, um, and that's because everyone's cancer is quite different, um, and people's um, people's cancer treatment stage that might be participating in, in this research could be quite different. Um, so. I guess the important thing is when it comes to hearing uh, hearing things in the media around diet and cancer is to have a think or if you can find out more information, you know how good was that was that research that's informing that. So Jane's already touched on um, the the ten cancers that are associated with overweight and obesity. Um, and we know that those include bowel, postmenopausal breast cancer, gallbladder cancer, kidney, liver, um, esophageal cancers, ovarian cancers, pancreatic, prostate in the advanced stages, and endometrial cancers. So the recent research from uh, the, the, the from Cancer Council Australia's preventability estimates found that around in 2010. Of the, of the new cases of cancer that were diagnosed in 2010, around 3,900 could be attributed to overweight or obesity. And when it comes to uh, recurrence of cancer, I think Jane's already mentioned that there is increasing evidence about excess weight um, being a factor in cancer outcomes. Um, but also there's increasing evidence around uh, being overweight or obese and um, the increased risk of recurrence and that's why it is important to, to encourage people to take steps to reduce their weight um, after, after they've been through their cancer treatment. And the, I think the other important factor is that setting goals to achieve a healthy weight can help to enhance the quality of life in, in cancer survivorship as well. So I'm going to talk about next, uh, there's a number of slides about the types of, of foods that we, we know a little bit about when it comes to cancer risk. Um, our favourite things at Cancer Council is fruits and vegetables and fibre. Um, it is... Can I just cut it? Yes. You can see in the chat there we've got, um, I can't quite say your name, Shippy is it? Talking about the paleo diet. It's oh, okay. Up there saying right. the GP recommended the paleo wow. diet, not to eat, you know, all the things they tell you. So right. I don't know whether you want to make a quick comment on that. Thing okay. Vegetables. Yeah. Look, with you know, with the paleo diet, that's probably the one that we're hearing most about at the moment. What you'll see, and and even um, even Rima sort of, you know, showed that plate from the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, um, and and that sort of includes the fruits and vegetables and the the fiber and the whole grains. Um, so the evidence when it comes to healthy eating for cancer prevention, and and also our advice for people who are under, you know, who are who are cancer survivors and also undergoing cancer treatment would be to eat in accordance with the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. So some of the things that you might be encouraged to avoid in the paleo diet, we would be quite comfortable with with people eating. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. And I've, I do have a slide about the things to, to look out okay. for. So I just Is that okay? I was, there, I was there. I thought we should mention it. Yes. Sorry. Everybody would have seen it. Sorry. No, no, no. That's good because I'm you yeah. know, not looking at everyone's comments now. No, I know. Um, and I was yeah. enjoying them before um, <laughs> when I'm not speaking. So yeah, fruit and veg are particularly important because we know that, um, in particular, non-starchy vegetables. So that you can see some of the non-starchy vegetables on the um, the right there are associated with decreased risk of some of the mouth and throat cancers, esophageal and stomach cancers. 
And the allium vegetables, which are those lovely oniony type things, um, there is um, some evidence around the link between those sorts of those sorts of vegetables and, and reduced risk of stomach cancer. And fruit is an area that um, that we're also seeing evidence uh, supporting um, a cancer prevention um, benefit when it comes to lung cancer, mouth, pharynx, and larynx, laryngeal cancers, as well as esophageal and stomach cancers. And there's also the importance of, of fibre. So fibre, obviously fruits and vegetables are a good source of fibre, um, but whole grain cereals, and that's you know that's something that's also important when it comes to reducing the risk of um, bowel cancer. So the the Cancer Council Australia preventability estimates um, looked in particular at fruits, vegetables, and fibre. And one of the things that we know is that only one in two Australian adults eat enough fruit, so the recommended serves of fruit are two serves of fruit, and only one in ten Australian adults are eating the recommended five serves of vegetables each day. Uh, so when they looked at, at what the recommendations were and what the, the Australian population were eating, they actually said that if more people were consuming the recommended amounts of, of fruits and vegetables and also fibre, that could be associated with around about a 4% um, reduction in, in cancers, and that's particularly around bowel cancer. And other evidence is, is sort of a building around the importance of dietary patterns that includes fruits and vegetables that are associated with um, increased survival following diagnosis and treatment. So dietary patterns, when we say dietary patterns, um, that probably means people who have include more fruits and vegetables in their diet are probably also eating healthier diets in other way, in other ways, and that can help to reduce the risk as well. So meat and processed meat is another one where there's quite a bit of evidence when it comes to bowel cancer in particular. And um, the, the, the concern is um, with eating too much red meat. So not eating any red meat. We know red meat um, is something that we can include in the diet, uh, you know, a healthy balanced diet. And the recommendations in the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating are around 455 grams of red meat per week. So it might not be as much as you think. So it's really like a, a small 65 gram portion, though I don't know how many people eat, would eat a 65 gram portion on one day. Um, you're probably more likely to eat two serves of, of that size yeah, and maybe only eat meat three to three or four times a week. So um, we certainly wouldn't be saying that meat is something that needs to be removed entirely, but diets, um, people who have higher red meat diets um, did have an increased risk of bowel cancer. Processed meats is the bigger concern though, and so that's that's one area where the recommendation is about um, avoiding too much processed meat. And it's probably one that we don't realise just how much we might be eating through our diets, whether or not it's breakfast time when we have some bacon on, on a Sunday if we go out, um, or the, the ham in, in the in the ham sandwich, or the the um, bacon in the pasta sauce or something like that. So that's probably one area I would say, you know, look out for just how, how frequently, if you do eat those foods, how, how frequently they're popping up in your diet each week. <clears throat> so as I mentioned there, it's diets high in red meat are associated with a moderately increased risk of bowel cancer and that's um, processed meats are, are of a particular concern. When the Cancer Council Australia research looked at the number of cases that might be attributed um, to, about, uh, to red meat consumption, um, they estimated that approximately 18% of bowel cancer cases um, that occurred in 2010 could be attributed to eating too much red and processed meat. And they also recommended that if people uh, change their consumption, and ate the you know according to the the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating when it comes to the red meat um, recommendation, then this could also impact on lowering cancer rates as bowel cancer rates as well. Alcohol, alcohol's the fun one. No one likes to be talking about alcohol. Um, but it is something that's really important for us to talk about and I know there have been a number of questions about alcohol, particularly alcohol in um, survivorship. Uh, so what we do know about the link between alcohol and cancer 
is that there are a number of cancers um, that is associated with an increased risk of. So bowel cancer, most people probably think of liver cancer because many people think of, well, if you have too much alcohol, you've got liver problems. Um, liver cancer is something that is associated with, um, with alcohol consumption, uh, but bowel cancer, um, breast cancer in both um, premenopausal women and postmenopausal women, as well as some of the mouth and, and um, throat cancers as well, and the esophageal cancer. So um, when it comes to the uh, Cancer Council Australia preventability estimates, obviously these were based on Australian consumption, looking at um, looking at Australian dietary patterns and from from previous uh, national nutrition surveys and looking at the rates of cancer in 2010. Um, and based on that, they estimated that more than 3,000 cancers would have been attributed to uh, alcohol consumption. And when they looked at um, the number, the, the types of cancers where they were seeing the greatest number of preventable alcohol-related cancers, it was in some of those more common cancers, which is probably to be expected, of, of the bowel and of breast. Um, but when it came to uh, the proportion, um, some of the other cancers, if, if people were addressing or, or reducing their alcohol consumption, um, it, there would be a really significant impact on other cancers such as um, the squamous cell carcinomas, uh, mouth and throat and esophageal cancers as well. So that's where they also saw um, significant benefit in people reducing their alcohol consumption. So the, the, when it comes to um, alcohol consumption in survivorship, just like I've sort of said before, the, the evidence is is still um, is still emerging. Um, what it seems to be say there's a suggestion that there is a bit of a worse prognosis for people who have had a head and neck cancer um, if they continue to drink alcohol at, ho at higher levels after diagnosis. The evidence around um, alcohol intake in breast cancer, and in, uh, as far as breast cancer reoccurrence is concerned, is is still a bit uh, still a bit mixed. Um, but really, the advice is that that just like many of us need to do to reduce our cancer risk, uh, alcohol related cancer risk, um, alcohol should be consumed in moderation. Um, there is no, we can't sort of recommend a level that is safe, and that you know that we don't at this point in time. Um, have a guideline that says this is the amount that is associated with, um, you know, no cancer risk essentially. But what we do advise that if, if people are going to be drinking alcohol, um, if you do choose to drink, then uh, drinking in accordance with the National Health and Medical Research Council's uh, alcohol guidelines, which would recommend having no, you know, limiting to two standard drinks per day. Um, certainly there's no, it's not compulsory to drink two standard drinks per day, um, but you know, that the advice is around um, you know, having no more than two standard drinks per day. Um, so the advice when you sum it all up to reduce cancer risk and reoccurrence is really what sort of we've gone through, that maintaining a healthy weight is important. Um, aiming for two serves of fruit and five serves of veg each day, eating a variety of whole grain and high fibre foods, having moderate amounts of lean red meat, but limiting or avoiding processed meat. Um, so much much clearer in, in the advice to avoid processed meats there. Choosing uh, low fat, sorry, low salt foods, high, low in salt, sugar, and added saturated fats in particular. Um, and limiting alcohol consumption if you choose to drink those two standard drinks as well. And that's, we've already seen some, very much. Um, one thing I did want to touch on was around um, the use of supplements. Um, so that's something that we also um, do get a lot of questions about as well. And what we have, you know, when, when the World Cancer Research Fund has looked at the evidence um, you know, there, there is still limited evidence to support supplement use, vitamin and mineral supplement use. The advice is still to, to, to get your nutritional needs through diet rather than supplements. Uh, the World Cancer Research Fund, um, when they have assessed the evidence around uh, some supplements, the benefits for supplements, um, they found that there was insufficient evidence, but they also found some concerns of safety of, di um, of some of the dietary supplements when it came to, to, um, 
to cancer risk, particularly for selenium, beta carotene, magnesium and chromium. And in some cases there was even a slightly increased risk, um, uh, risk of mortality associated with some of the antioxidant, uh, antioxidant supplements listed there. And one other concern is the high, high, phyto, high dose phytoestrogen supplements, which are not recommended for breast cancer survivors. Um, but soy foods are something that many people would still be able to include in a healthy balanced diet. It's just the phytoestrogen uh, high dose supplements. We're going to run out of time, are we? Oh, we can go five or ten minutes. Okay. Over as long as everyone's happy to stay with us. Okay. So there are just a few um, few situations where a health professional may recommend supplementation, and I just wanted to to address those here. Um, and that's you know because of the potential impact of, of the cancer treatment someone might have had um, to address other health conditions because you know people don't just often have um, one health condition when they have cancer there may be other conditions as well um, if there a, a deficiency has been diagnosed and the the nutrient sort of a nutrition or, or healthy eating approach um, to getting their, their vitamin and mineral needs is consistently um, inadequate. Click on. So this is the one that we often get a lot of questions about as well at Cancer Council. Um, and I you know I think at a time where you are going through cancer treatment you've probably seen a lot of the a lot of the sort of anti cancer diets and, and the superfoods um, when you when you've gone looking for information as well. Um, we would certainly be recommending eating according to the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, so including a balanced diet of fruits and veg, fibre, whole grains. Um, I think someone's asked about dairy foods as well. Dairy foods are very much a part of the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and so we would, we would recommend people um, be including those in their diet as well. But when it comes to spotting some of those fad diets and, and superfoods, I think um, anything that recommends that you avoid an entire food category whether or not that's carbohydrate foods um, or, or meat, uh, we wouldn't. We, we would consider a fad sort of fad diet and not something that needed to be um, to be followed. If it's requiring you to purchase lots of expensive equipment or supplements or foods that you just can't find in your local supermarket, that would be one where we sort of would say that that's that's um, that's not necessary to meet you know to to address your cancer or to to prevent cancer coming back. Coming up in the chat box about soy milk. Yes. So yes. Um, have any position on that? Well, soy. I think the real concern is around the high dose phyto phytoestrogen supplements. Soy foods. Um, we would be saying that you can include soy foods in a healthy, balanced diet. Um, someone who has had had um, breast cancer, who this might be an issue for, uh, but the phytoestrogen supplements might be an issue for. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise to start. You know. Start increasing all the soy foods in your diet if it's not something you would normally be doing. Um, but if you know if you need to use soy milk, then you know I wouldn't be. Well, they're saying that you know they're breast surgeons to stay clear of soy, not to have soy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say I, I think that would be a good good chance to talk to a dietitian to see you know if, if that's really something that they need to be doing. But our advice isn't that you need to steer clear of it totally. Yeah. Um, it's it's the supplement. So I think there's probably concern because of the soy supplement um, that that's sort of also translated to soy foods. We're not saying rush out and sort of you know start including lots more in your diet, but um, yeah. And sorry, yes, some other things that we also see are, are sort of claims that that diets or foods would um, you know will cure your cancer with amazing testimonials that it just sounds so wonderful. From a particular individual that has had their cancer cured by a particular diet or, or following an eating regime or supplement regime, and another one that we also see is the conspiracy theories that say they don't want you to know, but this is how you can eat to cure cancer. I think probably this is just my last slide. That was just you know some further information about making healthy choices when you're um, in the supermarket and I think the very first thing if what, you know we can get it get that across is that the Australian Guide to Eating is what Cancer Council recommends when it comes to um, reducing cancer risk and also um, eating uh, you know, healthy eating during survivorship. 
ingredients lists are also a really important thing to check um, because that really gives you an idea of what's really in your foods and looking at the fact that they're in descending order will give you an idea of just how much of the good ingredients are in um, and how much of the you know, sugars and fats and things like that. And then finally, just there's, there's a guide that you, people can use to, um, to, to make healthier sort of choices by looking at the nutrition information panel, which I think is probably what, what you were referring to from Enrich as well. Okay. Give me the mouth. Oh yeah, sure. Questions. Thank you. Okay, so question time. So we had a lot of questions. We had actually over 500 registrations and over 100 questions. So we kind of picked out some questions we thought would be good. So we've kind of addressed alcohol, but the question that came up was, should I cut out alcohol altogether? Which I think, as um, Claire was saying, the you can have the standard drinks, but you have to be strict with that, I think. Yeah, um, unless, you know, if the advice that you're getting from a health professional or a dietitian is that you need to, to remove it, but because we can't recommend a safe level as well, no. um, it's really difficult for us to say, avoid it entirely or this amount is okay. What about saving it all up for Saturday? No, oh, well, someone, someone was saying someone. that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, I mean that's part of the the Australian guide. To, uh, sorry, the drinking guidelines as well is not having any more than four in you know on one on drinking session. occasion. So whoever that was, <laughs> doing it. <laughs> um, and then the next one, which also came up, was about sugar, and we did have a yeah. lot of questions about sugar yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, does sugar really feed cancer tumours? Yes. Yeah. Well, sorry, not yes. Um, <laughs> so that's something that we've seen a bit more uh, of than getting those sorts of questions at Cancer Council. So um, with Cancer Council Australia, we've actually drafted an information sheet that can give you more information and we'll include that link. Yeah. Um, essentially, the advice is that sugar does not feed cancer cells, um, as some of the statements are indicating. Our concern with sugar would be in its contribu contribution to excess kilojoules and weight gain. Um, but you know, it, it's not the, the feeds cancer cell type, type um, myth that is certainly being discussed. Yeah, there's been a lot of going around about yeah. that, hasn't there? Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think Jane's going to talk about the next question about boosting your metabolism. Metabolism, yeah. So well, regular exercise and healthy eating um, we know can help to boost metabolism. And that is this particular question was talking about um, hormonal therapy. So I think it's a very individualised question and to, to answer it broadly, I mean there's lots of different factors that could come into play um, looking at metabolism. Um, so we're talking about um, weight issues, so um, weight gain or weight loss, um, what types of exercise are you doing at the moment, so resistance training, aerobic training um, and just being generally active through the day. Um, there's a lot of different things that do come into play, especially when you are looking at um, with the addition of using hormonal therapy. So it's something that I would probably take to, the med to your own um, medical team to discuss further. Um, but yeah, metabolism, if, yeah, healthy diet and regular exercise uh, can help, but there are a lot of individual things that, that can impact and slow it down as well. So it's a bit hard to answer, so, but I recommend um, going to speak to your own medical team. And I guess the next question for you too. Yeah, <laughs> how exercise. much? Too, too much. much. <laughs> Another tough one. Um, like we said, we, we, we do recommend that something is better than nothing and more is better than less, but then you've got um, ex other extremes. So we do see people at the moment who are running and are participating in, in marathons um, which is which is fine, and it's like with anyone doing any exercise, you, anyone can over exercise, which might lead to uh, stress injuries or or fatigue. And if you've already got something, if you've already got fatigue, um, if you are overtraining, um, you may make it worse. But again, it's a very individual basis. If you love to exercise, do it all the time. Great, <laughs> it's great. Um, but you need to go about it slowly. So um, I will touch quickly on fatigue, so if I've mm. got time. Yeah. If you find that fatigue is an issue with being active, so we know that resting for fatigue is probably not the most helpful thing to be doing. Um, Double-edged sword, if you're fatigued, you don't feel like moving and then you just get more fatigued. 
but the best thing is to try and break into that cycle if you can and just start to gent gently move around. And like Rima was saying earlier, um, starting small. So starting one block, see how that goes, see how your body holds up one day, two days later, fine, two blocks, um, and progressing that way. If you find you're getting to one block and then it's really wiping you out, we call that sort of a, a bust where you're really tired for the next day or two, you would probably pull that back. The next time you go for a walk, just do half the block instead of the full block and then see how your body responds and then build from there. So it's about getting in tune with your body. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. To your body. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and again, Claire's kind of covered this one here about um, <laughs> voices in the health industry mm -hmm. and where can we find relevant information mm -hmm. that we can trust. So. I think the um, the healthy eating yeah. um, slide, yeah. we'll send that to you as a link as well. I would um, also say the World Cancer Research Fund, if you're interested in looking at sort of more detailed information about where these guidelines come from and what yeah. informs them, then World Cancer Research Fund, which is also... Which is on the slide yeah, coming up as well. Yeah. So um, I guess, yeah, you be careful, which is another thing that we mentioned. So when you're hearing about research, look at where that where the information's come from and how mm. trustworthy it really yeah. is. So um, <clears throat> because, you know, there is a lot of mm. misinformation out and about. Um, the last question, how to promote the importance of nutrition mm. to cancer survivors who are at risk of chronic health conditions, late effects without making patients anxious and distressed. Which we I have to say we did have a little bit on social mm. media of mm. some people that were a bit distressed about I guess sort of feeling guilty that even though that they ate healthy and they were at a you know normal weight, they still had cancer and things like that. So I think, as we said, you know we're talking about a third of cancers mm. and not all cancers. Mm. So mm. and again, there's been a lot of chat I noticed about cancers of the blood, and we haven't really mentioned yeah. that much. And well, that's so because there isn't the evidence yeah. there about these yeah. sorts of associations. Yeah, there's yeah. small trials. Um, yeah. for in, uh, myeloma, multiple myeloma coming through, looking at more so addressing um, issues of fatigue. Um, but same principles and everything else when addressing fatigue like we spoke about before. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I mean the thing is we, we can only really talk about the, the research and the mm -hmm. evidence. You know, mm -hmm. We can't just sit here and make stuff up. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that's it. We've gone a little bit over time and thank you for those of you that have stayed with us till the end. So here are some resources, um, which is I think Claire was just saying was at the World Cancer Research Fund. Yes, there's lots of detailed info yep. if, that, if that's what you're interested in. <laughs> and Cancer Council New South Wales, yep. which is our site, and the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, which was yep. the, that, that little slide. But we'll send you all this um, when we send you the link to the recording. And um, again, Cancer Council Important information is 13, 11, 20, so it's nationwide. You can ring up, ask any question you've got. Um, and again, Lifeline 13, 11, 14, if there's anything tonight that's upset you and you feel you need to speak to somebody, please give them a call. So thank you to the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, you, Rima, for thank coming you. and telling your story. <laughs> it was lovely. Yes. Beautiful images. Okay. And thank you, Jane, for sharing thank all your knowledge. You. And Claire, thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you to everyone that logged on and um, we're seeing lots of things that we've got pink tomorrow and seven bricks and all sorts of things <laughs> yep. chatting going on. So we can just sit here and you can keep chatting if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed the webinar. Um, for the men that are logged on, we've got a men's webinar coming up on the 5th of November so we will send you an invite to that. So, And even for the wives that might be there that have got a husband with cancer. So thank you so much and we'll say goodnight. Thank See you. See you later. Bye. Thanks.